So this whole idea of what a farmer is, is gonna change. It has to change. What we're trying to do is fast pace what you would originally do with research and development. How many times do you think you can solve a problem which is going to allow a clinician to now save a life? In open source, there is no foundation as to who can contribute. This way we get a lot of perspectives on a single idea. Creating ways for everybody to engage in asking questions is profoundly important. And it's clear that our key mission is to provide access, not to protect treasure. If there is something that open source is, this is the example. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Red Hat Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer, Tim Yaton. Welcome. Welcome, how's everybody? Awesome. Well, uh, I'd like you to welcome you all to uh, Summit Day 2 Afternoon Edition. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Now, those of you who were with us in San Francisco may know or may remember that I got a kind of a bad reputation for telling dad jokes. I never thought they were bad, but other people said they were bad. So I'm not going to do dad jokes this time. Um, so no worries, okay, that's just the way it's gonna be. However, I do wanna make an observation. Um, if you're like me, have you been rummaging through the Cool Stuff store? Isn't it unbelievable? I mean, I already spent a fortune. Like I got, I got shirts, I got the, the napkin, whatever you call it, I got socks. You know, I bought this really cool man bracelet. Have you seen these? Isn't that awesome? Um, I also, I bought one of these, um, what do you call it? Popper toys, pop socket toys, but mine doesn't actually work. You know, every time I put it on the table to make it pop, it just sticks to it. I don't know what's wrong with it. But, uh, and for those of you here in last night's keynote, um, one of the things we are clearly going to add to the Cool Stuff store are some beer koozies. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Today, this afternoon's keynote, as we've done in the past, is all about expanding our horizons around what are the things are open source and open source style innovation impacting in the industry, you know, whether it be our work, our lives individually, or even society. Now, we all know that open source has become the default for software development and innovation. Paul talked about that today. Um, but it's really reaching now beyond just the scope of software and technology innovation. Uh, it's actually permeating every conversation that we're having in society at this time. Uh, the open source way is creating uh, innovations in all kinds of disciplines and open source principles, culture, and collaboration are impacting us uh, across the board as we'll explore in detail today. So one of the things that this style innovation is doing now is creating tools and capabilities that people and communities are using to go solve new problems or pursue new opportunities. And in fact, in many cases, it's actually unifying and strengthening those communities themselves. In years past at Summit, we've celebrated a number of, of themes in this context. The impact of the individual, power of participation, ideas worth exploring. But in all cases, they're just part of the Red Hat way, which is the open source way. We feel compelled to bring these broader open source stories to life, uh, highlighting the cultural impacts of collaboration and, and community innov innovation, excuse me. And we're inspired because these stories are your stories. And we hope that you'll take some of these ideas and inputs, bring them back to your organizations and your communities and take advantage of them. This afternoon, we'll share a number of amazing examples of how individuals are changing the world with open source approaches. And it's gonna be interesting because it's gonna be things that, that you may not expect. Things like music, like farming, and even like rockets. That one you're gonna to have to wait to know what it really means. Think of today as a celebration of open source style collaboration and innovation, where it is today, and more importantly, where it's going and who's taking it there. So to kick us off, I'd like to start with bringing up my friend and colleague, Delissa Alexander, to the stage. 
Thank you. Please welcome Red Hat Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer, Delissa Alexander. So thanks to Tim for getting us started. At Red Hat, we believe that open unlocks the world's potential. I know that's why I've been here for 18 wonderful years. We use open development practices and open models to help our customers, our partners, and developers unlock their potential and the world's potential. Now that's something worth celebrating, so let's take a minute to celebrate. You've heard from customers like Deutsche Bank and Delta about how our open approach to collaboration helps to deepen partnerships, helps to create powerful ability to innovate together and unlock new business models. In some cases, we're even going to market together because we realized that the value we can create together is much greater than the value that either of us can provide alone. Now, today, we're celebrating people people who use open source to unlock the next generation's potential. This year is our fifth annual Women in Open Source Awards Ceremony. All of our 2019 finalists are passionate contributors to open source. We invited the community to vote and more than 8,000 people voted to select our two winners today. Now we celebrate the contributions of women in open source for a reason. We want to be a catalyst in creating greater gender diversity in open source communities. We know from experience that diverse teams can see different angles to solve problems. They can imagine different solutions and, importantly, it reduces unintended bias. Our winners are evidence that when we focus on making communities more diverse and inclusive, we can actually make that input. One of our winners is a 2016 White House Champion for Change. Another has contributed to Wikimedia, GNOME, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Their work exemplifies how open can unlock personal potential and how open source can have an exponential impact, creating opportunities for whole communities to unlock their potential. Now to introduce our winners this year, and their contribution to open source, let's listen to what they say inclusion means. Began when I started contributing in open source, I noticed that out of 40 contributors, we were only two women. And I thought that something needs to be done about increasing the women contributors. There is a lot of focus now on how to get more people into the community, not putting up walls. There's a lot of projects and things you can do that even if you're not a coder, you can help contribute. Open source is a great way to learn a new technology and open source is a great way to build communities. We have this weekly show that we do called Show and Tell. We got an email from a parent. He said, my daughter turned to me and said, are there any boy engineers or are they all girls? Just because we have such a wonderful community that's so inclusive and we have such a wide range of people showing off their projects, this girl was living in a world where she could see so many people of different backgrounds doing engineering. In open source, there is no foundation as to who can contribute. This way we get a lot of perspectives on a single idea. When you give people open source, what they do with it, you can't even imagine it. Please welcome Women in Open Source Community Award winner, Lamore Freed, and Women in Open Source Academic Award winner, Saloni Gerg. Thanks for joining us and congratulations. Thank you, it's so exciting. Yeah. Let's take a minute to chat here. Okay. All right, Lamore, we're honoring you because of your pioneering voice. You've created open hardware platforms for educators and makers of all skill levels 
you've helped made platforms for sharing the magic of open source. Uh, we're really excited about you being here and we want to hear from you. So tell us, as we celebrate the impact of open source today, why is open hardware so important? Well, I'm so glad you asked that because I'm, I'm the expert here. <laughs> so I think what Red Hat has done for open source software, which is bring it around the world, introduce it to people, and show people you can have a successful business, you can have open source software, you can have a community of contributors. We can do the same thing for hardware, whether it's medical technology or skateboards or cosplay. Everyone here can contribute to open source hardware make cool blinky stuff. You're still coding, but now you get to share it physically with other people. A lot of fun, too. It's true. Saloni, so we're honoring you today because of your passion around inclusion and diversity and inclusion communities. Um, you've been involved with Women Tech Makers Group, Women Who Code, A Million Women to Tech, just to name a few. So in your own words, why is it so important for inclusion to exist in open source communities? Well, open source helps in collective innovation by promoting a free exchange of ideas. When I say free, it means there are no, no limits to gender, color, or religion to join in the motion. Open source communities need to be inclusive as they are a very good starting point for anyone who wants to learn more about technology. So I believe the world is certainly changing for good, and women are also becoming active participants and contributors. Yay. That's great. So now tell us, if people want to get more involved in open hardware, what can people in the audience do? And so that there's so many amazing, skilled, talented, brilliant, creative engineers here in sysadmins, coders of all types, and everyone here is so good at technology, and there's a lot of people in your community who could totally use your help. So whether it's a 4-H group, or a FIRST Robotics, or a Girl Scout troop who's building robotics, Join your community and share the technology that you know, whether you're coding or websites or what have you, to help them and maybe build some robots together, build some cosplay together. You're going to have fun, they're going to have fun, and you'll build open source hardware together. Sounds like fun. Yes. Yes. So now for the awards. Thank you for your contributions. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> Congratulations to you okay. both. Thank you. Right, closer, closer. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Okay. One of the biggest honors in my role is that I get to celebrate our Women in Open Source Award winners every year. They're role models for future generations. So now, let's look to the future by learning about how a unique open source project in the Middle East is fostering collaboration across whole communities. The kids are from two different schools. If you actually look in a map, it's a 20 minute drive. But these kids will probably never meet each other in their life if they weren't coming here and doing this program with Red Hat. On the first day when the kids show up, all they see are their differences. They come from different schools, they speak a different language, and at first you can see two groups. Gradually, when you were coming from meeting to meeting, they started to share things, they started to communicate. They are saying that they have the same issues when they are coding. They are asking each other to, to help to solve the problem. Through that work, they get closer together. And you see that the differences start to go away. ואני מאמין שההשפעה שלנו הייתה כל כך גדולה לשנות את החשיבה של התלמידים. Year after year, the kids, they want to come here because they know it's fun. The goal of the program is to bring kids from different mentality, even language, to actually interact. I believe that the open source way is the way to educate people and kids all around the world. Please join me in welcoming 
four mentors and two students from the Rose Project who created this amazing bridge building open source experience. Yay, welcome. So great to see you. Thank you so much for coming to join us here at Summit. So excited about what you're going to be telling us about today. So Yasmin, you completed the 14-month program about a year ago. Can you tell us, what did you learn from participating? I learned about open source and how to code. I met new kids from different cultures, and we still in touch until now. It helped me to learn the base of open source, and now I learn more languages. That's great. Yo, Tom, you completed the program four years ago, and you just recently graduated from high school. Congratulations. Tell us, how did the Rose Project help you to be able to give back to your community? Well, uh, participating in the Rose Project was my first introduction to open source values and communities. Starting the project, I didn't know Python, and now I do a year of volunteering, and I teach eighth graders Python and open source using the Rose materials from GitHub. It's so impressive. You can really see how open source makes a difference, and how exponential impact it has. So in the spirit of open, would you share with us the race demo that you created in the project? Sure. Awesome. Good. Freddie, tell us, what are the students about to show us? Sure, so Red Hat Engineers wrote an open source game that allowed the kids to code the behavior of the car. Yutan, can you show us some of the code, please? Yeah. So it can be a complex algorithm or a simple one. It allows the students to implement in different levels according to their programming skills. Let's see a game. OK, as you can see, they also changed the penguin to the Red Hat logo <laughs> for the summit. Yotam, can you tell us about the code that you wrote? Yeah. Uh, my algorithm focused on get as many as bonuses, as you can see, the hats, as I can, so I could achieve many uh, points that finally I will win. What about you? Um, I tried to pass as much, as much as possible the obstacles in order to get more points. Go ahead. Thank you. And this time the winner is your time. Congratulations, your time. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with us. So we learned a little bit about the Rose Project in our uh, introductory video, but let's dig a little bit deeper and let's just chat. So tell us, open source values and practices, how has that made an impact on the program? Well, the students come from different schools, different cultures, and isolated communities. We show them how being part of the open source world allows them to collaborate with diverse people all around the world. The kids learn to work together with people they wouldn't normally meet in their day-to-day -day lives. Or even if they did meet, they probably wouldn't talk to each other because they don't speak the same language. In our course, they learn one language they now all share, Python. So cool. So, um, Ellie, how have the students progressed in the program? How do you see them change over time? So, on the first day, you can see a long table. All the kids from Tia on one side, and all the kids from Ranana on the other. As the course goes on, similarities like hobbies and schoolwork take over the language and, and cultural differences. By the end, we have one group of teenagers all collaborating and sharing co code together. We can't even tell them apart. <sighs> That's amazing. Anat, you've been involved from the very beginning. Can you tell us the impact that the program has made over the last five years? Yeah, the impact was quite big. Uh, we have over 50 children that otherwise might have never heard of open source in Linux, got the chance to learn this technology, and some of them even decided to focus on the STEM education. We have the two schools and even the two cities continue on collaborating on different uh, projects as a result of this course being given for the past five years. And lastly, over 30 associates were involved in this project along the years. This empowered the sense of belonging to Red Hat and the satisfaction in giving back to the community. It's very, very impressive. And I think the future of open source is in pretty good hands here, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah.
So thank you all for joining us. It's so great welcome. to see you. Yeah. If you're out on the floor in the expo later today, please stop by our Culture of Collaboration booth. There you can find the Rose Project students and learn more about the amazing work that they're doing. So it's been my honor to be able to share with you how open source um, goes beyond the code and helps to expand our possibilities. That's the open source way, and that's the Red Hat way. To me, it is so inspiring to see how we're bridging the gaps for bold change. It's the power of partnership, it's the why of open source, and it's why Paul said this morning, now is the most exciting time for communities in open source. And at Red Hat, we feel that with our customers and our partners working together, our potential has never been great. Innovating and co-creating the future together, that's what we're looking forward to. Red Hat has always been open. Red Hat is open. And Red Hat will be open in the future because open unlocks the world's potential. Let's welcome Tim back to the stage and learn about our open brand project. We're back. So uh, I hope you found that uh, those stories as inspiring as we have. Uh, I'd like to thank Delissa to the Rose Project team and our women in open source winners. Maybe one more round of applause for them all. So you heard Delissa talk about why we do things the open source way. And you've also heard it from our other speakers. You know, Paul talks about the open source development model and how committed we are to make everything open. Jim talks about how we manage the company as an open organization. And in a moment, Lee Day is gonna share with you how we actually uh, tell your open source stories in an open source style, the way we create them, the way we communicate them, and the way we share them. Um, there's one other example I'd like, like to share with you, though. Uh, if you look around the summit, you'll notice we've changed our mark, or changed our brand. Um, I'd like to share with you the unique way we went about this, what we learned, and what it's like to update a brand completely in the open, in the open source way. So I came into the CMO role from a BU role about two years ago, and I will tell you, the last thing I ever imagined doing was changing the mark. You know, long time uh, Red Hat employee, you know, 19 years we've had Shadow Man. I actually don't own a piece of clothing that I've paid for. I just wear Shadow Man stuff, always have. Um, but at the time, the Shadow Man icon was really a tongue-in-cheek reference to how Red Hat Linux, actually box product at the time, as Paul talked about, and open source more generally, were infiltrating the data center of the 90s. So at the time, it made sense, and it's grown to be an icon that we have all loved. But fast forward to 2017, we were having challenges with the mark. It didn't render well, particularly in small digital contexts like cell phones, which everybody's using to communicate, including two with us. Uh, the company name was one word when it's actually two, so lots of confusion. Was it capital? Was it not? Was it one? Was it two? Um, so we started to realize that we have some challenges here. So we ran some perception surveys for both existing associates, our, our employees, existing customers, and those that don't know who we are, and asked them what they thought the current mark stood for. And we were surprised that, you know, the, 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 but it's, it shouldn't have been because it's what we, the mark stood for 19 years ago. You know, sinister, sneaky, those sorts of things. Certainly not what we as a company believe we stand for and strive for every day in our openness. So, you know, that was, that was our problem for us. And then people started to point out some of the other challenges with the logo. I think the one I find uh, still most entertaining is that if you look at it just the right way, it looks like two dinosaurs arguing with each other. <laughs> now, for those of you who haven't seen that before, I'll give you a hint. Look at the black elements below the existing Shadow Man hat and then you'll never unsee it again. That's guaranteed. It's all you'll ever see in the hat. So we realized we had, to, we had to think about how to modernize the logo, but we also knew that we had to do this in the open and in the open source way, the only way we knew how. And we think we've gotten a better outcome as a result. So in December 2017, we launched our open brand project. 
and invented t-shirts to go with them. Um, and then we announced it publicly shortly thereafter in early 2018. And over that period of time, we've literally gotten thousands of inputs, survey answers, emails from our own associates and from you all around what you think we should be doing in terms of evolving the mark. In fact, at last year's summit in San Francisco, when I was on the stage there, I asked you all to come down to our open brand project booth and give us direct feedback at the meeting, and literally hundreds of you did that. And you've been part of our redesign process ever since. So we, we reviewed this with our uh, in-house brand. We also used uh, an industry-leading designer, Paula Scher, and we did, the work began in earnest. And like any open source project, not all the ideas made it. But what drove our final decisions all throughout was the feedback we were getting from you all. So the feedback, as you might imagine, given what you've seen us evolve to, is that the literal red hat was viewed far and away as the most important element of the modernized brand. Now, that being said, we had 45 different recommendations of what type of hat to use. So for those of you who were in Boston at the summit two years ago, my personal favorite is the co-branded baseball hat with the Red Sox. Clearly, that did not make the cut. Uh, but in the end, you know, the red fedora was viewed by everybody as iconic. Well in excess of 80% of respondents said, you know, it needs to be the red fedora. Now, why is this important? Well, for some people, you know, a logo's just a logo, a brand's a brand. You see it, you forget it, you move on. But for us, it's much, much more. It's, you know, we think it needs to be reflective of the culture, the identity, and the ethos that we've built as a company around open source for the last 25 years. It's that important to us. And most important, we want it to reflect our passion as employees and how we live the open source way every day. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. You know, the passion is, is, ele you know, is elemental to us all. You can ask the people who've had the existing shadow man Tattoo, tattooed to their body, um, what it means to them. Today, you can ask a number of Red Hatters who've in fact had the new logo tattooed to their bodies. What does it mean to them? They came to us and asked for it before Summit, so they could be showing it here even before we released it. Now, don't mind all the needles, the screaming, crying. Uh, it's not going to be that bad, um, but for a lot of our folks, not him, not Michael. <laughs> it's their first tattoo. Literally their first tattoo. Who's that guy? Oh. Yep, that's me. So, here you go. So, if the video doesn't prove it, that's real. <laughs> yes, it hurt. It hurt a lot, actually. Now, wouldn't you think someone in our open org might have told me how much this was going to hurt? Nope. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm one of the passionate ones here, too. You know, always have been. Uh, so, for me, it was just a natural thing to do. But the most important point is to thank you all for inputs to the brand, uh, for how much you've been uh, uh, tra traversing the Cool Stuff store and buying swag. Um, we hope you share the same level of passion for open source and what Red Hat's trying to do for and with you as we do. So let's go back to the rest of the program. We're going to continue our exploration of how the open source way uh, is expanding into more and more areas with a new set of open source stories. So I'm, I'm going to turn the stage over to Lee Day, who's our VP of Corporate Communications. She's been my friend and colleague for well over 15 years. And she's got the hardest job in the company because her team and her job is to do their best to make me look good out here. So not easy. So without any further ado, let me bring out Lee Day. Please welcome Red Hat Vice President, Marketing Communications and Brand, Lee Day. Uh, uh, 
so I guess no one told Tim that temporary tattoos were an option. I don't know. This is a story about you, your lives, your work, your ideas, your passion, and your contributions. Take a look at the creativity that surrounds you here at the summit. These films, this stage, these demos. Command line heroes, open source stories, customer stories. From your first visit to redhat.com to your experience here at this very conference, all of these words and pictures and experiences, even our new logo, tell the story of open source technology. And I'm very proud to say this. It was Red Hatters collaborating with creative partners who brought this all to life. But re what really makes us proud is this. You shaped it. Our evolving brand, shaped by its true stakeholders, you. Our successful podcast, we built this with interviews with you. Our work with nonprofits and children's hospitals through open innovation labs. These are times we listened to and learned from you. Customer stories. This is where you become the centerpiece. And these stories don't happen without you doing what you do, sharing with us. You are the source. And the millions of people and projects in the open source community gave us the model for this internal creative community. This is how we learned and built the Red Hat Open Studio. The Red Hat Open Studio is an open community where creativity is the code. We're creators, writers, art directors, filmmakers, and strategists, animators and UX designers, social media experts, and so many more. And collectively, we all dream very big. And we are Red Hatters. So we're grounded in technology and in open source. When we looked at creating a creative community, we knew we had to do this in an open way. An open community with agile processes and a meritocracy of ideas. Sound familiar? Principles like these aren't usually applied to marketing. In fact, one question I get from people who work hard to maintain their communities is this. Why now? Why do this this way? And I'll tell you why. Because we looked at tech marketing, and what we saw was a lot of shine in need of substance, in need of a jolt of truth, a jolt that only true stories could deliver. But truth in marketing is pretty hard. And making the decision to change the way you do marketing is really hard. And we could not do it alone. And the good news is we don't have to. We create by listening, learning, and building. The success of Command Line Heroes is testament to the power of this approach. This podcast is the product of nearly 500 interviews with developers and sysadmins. And we learn from their lives and experiences on the command line. And now we're close to a million downloads. And we're getting for the, ready for the launch of season three this June. That's a huge audience listening to the story of open source innovation told by the very people who live it. We listen to customers so we can tell authentic customer stories because authenticity comes from working with subject matter experts, customers, and audiences to make the story of innovative products like Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Red Hat OpenShift true, human, and real. The story of technology innovation isn't just about dreaming of a better world. It's recognizing where emerging technologies can solve global human challenges. Creating Chris started when a team at Boston Children's Hospital had an idea for how technology could improve patient care. Projects that merge technology and social good remind us why open source is so important. When code and ideas are freely available to all, passionate people can contribute and make a real impact. Open source transcends technology. The impact expands across industries, across regions, and around the world. And customer stories are inspired by real people and created to be shared with real people. As stewards of the lessons of collaboration, we want to give back. Listen, learn, build, and share. We want to help other organizations and business leaders around the world understand and use open source principles. From what we learned, we created the Open Organization Series. This started with a book by Jim Whitehurst on how Red Hat and other global brands are using meritocracy to ignite passionate work and truly let the best ideas win. And that's what the Red Hat Open Studio is truly about. Listen, learn, build, and share. And we're contributing what we've learned and built back to the community. 
like our content style guide, our new brand fonts, and the CoLab curriculum. We continue to follow this process to tell new stories that showcase meritocracy and the growing impact of open source. Through our open source story series, articles, live talks, films, and more, we're highlighting how open source transcends technology to affect our daily lives. You inspired us. And together, we're crafting the stories that this industry really needs. Today, we're featuring open source stories from innovators applying open technology to agriculture. And stick around, because we're ending with a demo like you've never seen before at the summit, and you won't want to miss it. But next, you're going to hear how the future of hardware and even the future of open source is helping the future of farming. And for that, please help me welcome from MIT, Professor Neil Gershenfeld. Thank you. Please welcome Director, MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, and Chair of Fab Foundation, Professor Neil Gershenfeld. So let me start by, instead of you applauding me, me applauding all of you. This is a fabulous community. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. But you can applaud yourself if you want. Um, I direct the Center for Bits and Atoms at MIT that works on the boundary of digital and physical, which I've never understood. I'm happy to take credit for the observation that computer science was one of the worst things ever to happen to either computers or to science because it's unphysical. The theory of computer science violates physics, and so we've been studying how you bring them back together. And that led to things like the first quantum computations, uh, creating uh, first synthetic life, earliest synthetic life, uh, coding in materials, and it led to the beginning of what's now called the Internet of Things. The crazy idea then of putting the Internet into things came out of thinking that thought. And so merging digital to physical in turn led to amazing people uh, like my student uh, Jason, who built and runs all the computers at Facebook, and my student Rafi, who built and runs all the computers at Twitter. And that's strange because I'm not a computer scientist and I didn't teach them data centers, but I taught them physics and their job is uh, billions of dollars and millions of watts to make information, and so you can't believe in software separate from hardware, you need to merge them. And so that's the kind of research we're doing at Center for Bits and Atoms. What's coming out of that, which is what I want to tell you about today, is a remarkable scaling. So the first real-time computer was the Whirlwind made at MIT. There was one of those. It was commercialized as PDPs. There was thousands of those that were used to create the internet. That led to millions of hobbyist computers, billions of personal computers, trillions of internet of things. What's happening now is the same thing for manufacturing. So one computer-controlled machining made at MIT in 1952, led to fab labs I'll tell you about, led to machines making machines, to assemblers, to self-assemblers. So we're really working on how to make the replicator. And to get there, prompted by the analogy with mini computers, which is when the internet, email, video games, word processing, all of that happened, we started setting up mini computers for fabrication. My lab is tens of millions of dollars. We set up mini versions that would fit in about this much of the stage, about a $100,000 investment. And these fab labs, like the mini computers, accidentally went viral. We set up one or two of them, uh, but they've been doubling every year and a half for 15 years. And so what you see here is uh, some of these interesting fab labs and locations from the far north of Norway to the bottom of Africa. In these labs, you can go from digital to physical and physical to digital and make almost anything. So some of the examples here are consumer electronics. Uh, you can make equipment to grow food. You'll hear more about that. Uh, urban infrastructure. And one of the most interesting things you can make is the machines themselves. Increasingly, you can go to a fab lab to make a fab lab to make more fab labs. So digital to physical and physical to digital. Now, this is really open source hardware, but open source hardware rests on open source software. So we've built on a, a, pack, a suite of great tools for open source software that we've had to compose. So you can go from design to CAD to CAM to machine control to motion control and actually make something. Historically, those are separated. They weren't designed around one person doing all of that. We've had to build on open source software to merge it to create these integrated workflows to empower an individual to do uh, digital fabrication. 
And here's the scaling. Gordon Moore made the most famous graph in history, five points that he saw lining up. It's this great article, Cramming More Components, that you should read if you haven't. He forecast 10 years of that. He got everything right except for that. It was 50 years of what came to be known as Moore's Law. What I'm showing you in the bottom graph is 10 years of Fab Labs doubling. Straight line on a log plot. It's clearly exponential. And so I won't make Gordon's mistake and say it'll go for 10 years because it's already gone for 10 years. The real conclusion is this is going to go for 50 years. Moore's law is ending for silicon, but we're just at the beginning of a Moore's law for the physical world going from digital to physical. The science is there, which I showed you quickly, and the data is there. So what does it mean to have 50 years of that scaling? Well, here are some of the fab labs. Uh, the one second in on the top is Bhutan, which is based not on gross domestic product, but gross national happiness. They measure not how much money did you make, but what is your well-being, what is your health. But they had to buy crap trucked in from India or China. So that lab helps them make gross national happiness physical. Uh, picking up on the last group, uh, this is a lab in Holan in Israel where mixed communities of Arabs and um, come together. Uh, this is in Northern Ireland at the Protestant Catholic Boundary um, Arts Colony in Maine, inner city Detroit. These are these remarkable places where these labs are flourishing. To keep up with that, we had to create a foundation for operational capacity and a very exciting program. Today I gave a class to 100 sites around the world in the Fab Academy, not for distance learning on a screen, but for distributed learning where students have peers in work groups with mentors in these labs locally, and then we connect them globally to tap more of the brain power of the planet, bright inventive people wherever they are in the world. And so once you can do that, uh, and once the slide updates, uh, it has these implications. Uh, uh, the picture towards the right is Barcelona's mayor. Barcelona has 50, or former mayor, has 50% youth unemployment, fabulous design sense, but a whole generation can't work as we understand it today. And so he's starting a 40-year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. You expect the city to provide electricity or clean water. It's now deploying these labs as part of the means to make in the city so you can produce what you consume. And on the list, there are a number of other cities joining Barcelona in this 40-year countdown. Uh, on the left, is uh, we ran a lab right outside the window of the Oval Office. It was funny, it was um, Secret Service bringing in high-power lasers, but Obama loved it. And um, what came out of that is legislation in Congress right now for universal access to digital fabrication. In the same way we have access to communication and computation, now the idea is there should be universal access to the means to make as a national scale initiative. And that's a bill in Congress right now. And what that leads to is among the most sensitive issues on the planet right now are income inequality, uh, uh, tariffs, uh, diver yeah, diverging incomes, all of these tensions about jobs, the economy, they all have an underlying assumption, which is work equals jobs equals money equals consumption. Uh, it used to not be that for most of human history. It's been like that only fairly recently. So think about if you go into a fab lab, and make something, like all the things I showed you. You don't need the global supply chain. You don't need all the pieces of the economy. Consumers are empowered to be creators. And rather than battling head-to-head, uh, -head, you can think globally. Data can travel freely, but you can fabricate locally. And so the labs I showed you are doing this wonderful work where um, you can work for traditional money with part of your time. You can work in a post-salary economy for barter and exchange with part of your time. And some Part of your time can be economic activity that's not based on making money, but it's based on transformation, education, learning, benefits for you. And so once you can go from digital to physical, it's really challenging very basic assumptions about what is work and what is money and how does an economy function once you can cross that boundary. Uh, so, if you're interested, once a year, all these labs get together. It travels around the world. It was from MIT a few years ago. Uh, this year, they're all gathering in Egypt. It's in uh, Canada next year. And then the country of Bhutan is going to host this whole network the year after that. But more than that, if you're interested, uh, this is a book I recently wrote 
with my brothers. My younger brother, Alan, developed and ran the video game studio at Activision. He ran the world's biggest video game studio. Uh, and my older brother, Joel, ran the National Labor Relations Organization. And we wrote this book together because they didn't trust me. <laughs> um, they trusted me to get the technology right, but not the impact. And so what I presented at the beginning was a snapshot of how to scale digital fabrication from one to a thousand to a million to a billion to a trillion. And that's not a metaphor. Uh, the, the smart thermostat today or your wristwatch has the com computational capacity of the early mini computers. In the same sense, I really mean a trillion fab labs, a trillion equivalents of the capability of the room filling machinery that fits in your pocket. That's the research roadmap. But for the digital revolution, it's created great opportunity, witness this room, but also it's it took us decades to catch up to like, uh, inequality of access to it and the spread of fake news and all the things that have gone wrong digitally. And so Joel and Alan didn't trust me to get that part right. This book is us working that out. But more than that, I would invite all of you, rather than waiting 50 years to deal with this, this is the moment, just like when the internet emerged, but it's now an internet in a physical world. So take away, we're beginning a Moore's Law. This has come to be called Lass's Law for digital to physical. It lets anybody make almost anything. It fundamentally changes what is an economy. It brings open source software out here into the physical world, and we invite and really need all of you to help create that world. Thank you. Some of the challenges that we're facing in agriculture is to produce more food in a changing climate, to grow food where it was not being grown previously. We said, why not have our students talk about what we're growing, how we're growing it. Everyone kind of like sees different challenges in what they're doing and picking up on these different solutions based on open source technology. We're all coming together to help solve problems that are really going to be important when we inherit the world. We have the potential for every farm, every backyard to essentially be a personal research farm. This whole idea of what a farmer is, is gonna change. It has to change. Please welcome Research Director, Wolf's Neck Center, co-founder FarmHack, and co-founder FarmOS, Dorn Cox. Hi, my name is Dorn Cox, and I'm a co-founder of FarmHack. FarmHack is a community project, an open source community and network that, that links farmers together with non-farmer allies to come up with creative solutions to complex agricultural challenges. I grew up on a farm, but it wasn't until I met my wife and came back to the farm that I came to understand the deep connection and underlying power of open source technology and agriculture, and particularly the necessity, actually, of open source to achieve and to practice the kind of agriculture I wanted to practice, regenerative agriculture. I became increasingly impressed with the innovation that happens on farms every day, on every farm, and the potential for sharing across the rich and diverse global network and to democratize the code for regenerative agriculture. I came to see agriculture not as an isolated rural enterprise like any other business, but rather something different a multi-generational team effort, a shared human endeavor, a public science that defines who we are in our environment and who we are with each other. Leonardo da Vinci said that we know more about the heavens above than the soil beneath our feet. And yet, in the last decades, we've begun to unlock the secrets of soil. In every handful of living, healthy soil, there are more organisms than there are people on Earth. 
And every seed we exchange represents not just millions of years of evolution, but from a civilization's perspective, it's the original open source. It contains our choices, our environments, our cultures that are cumulative. And so we now have the capacity to extend that same metaphor to our own technology. We can capture and exchange the code for regenerative agriculture in something about the size of a seed. So what could be more valuable than sharing and cross-pollinating that code? Because the stakes are huge. The choices that we make in agriculture will have ripple effects for generations to come. It will affect the quality of our water, the quality of our air. It will affect the abundance and diversity of the species that we share the planet with. It will affect the nature of conflict. It will affect our resilience to floods, to droughts, to fire, and it will affect the, the climate. It's going to affect not just the abundance, but the possible scarcity that we'll be leaving the next generation. So we need everyone everywhere to have access to the best possible agricultural knowledge because we know that we can draw down atmospheric carbon and turn it into healthy soil faster than we thought possible. And just small changes in our soils can have large effects because there is more carbon in our soils than there is in our atmosphere. So just a 1% change in our agricultural soils over the next 20 years, 1% increase in organic matter can put us on the path put us on the path to put us on the path to pre-industrial atmospheric carbon levels. And that same 1% increase acts like a sponge and, add, and increases the water holding capacity of that soil by as much as 20,000 gallons. So what we need to do to adapt to climate change also will mitigate climate change and also regenerate and re restore our environments. It's a large-scale effort, to be sure. And yet, I believe that it's achievable because it's based on the same biological principles that created a livable climate in the first place. And what could be more urgent? What could be more tested? What could be more, what could be more tested and have more history than the process of photosynthesis, of taking, taking sunlight and turning it into living roots that feed microbes that build soil? And what could be more urgent? So this, the solution is management, but management is people combined with knowledge. So people are part of the solution if we can create solutions that are smaller and more accessible to get appropriate site-specific knowledge to take action on the ground. This is the merging of hardware and software and transforming it into action on the ground, into nature. And so we have the opportunity to transform a tragedy of the commons, of an economy based on competition for scarce resources, and translate that into a triumph of the commons based on abundance from knowledge. of taking that which has been invisible in nature and turning it into something that's visible and therefore the unvalued into the valuable. We can be dominated by this same technology or we can use it to understand and improve our shared environment. Because the tools we create are a reflection of our ecological, our economic and our social systems. We can choose to democratize them and we can move from a vision of precision agriculture to decision agriculture, from large-scale mechanization and consolidation to one based on embracement, embracing the complexity of the underlying systems of democratizing and distributing and adapting and innovating. So what questions are we going to use and what questions, what tools are we going to use and what questions are we going to ask with this new power? Because agriculture is a culture. 
It's the culture of the field. It's a biological culture. It's a social culture. It's an economic culture. It's also the culture and joy of observing and managing the small details of nature and finding meaningful work with friends and family and community, eating and drinking and creating. It has the potential to build bridges across rural and urban divides, across geographic, language, and cultural boundaries, rooted in our ability to create abundance from scarcity, in creating environments where 12 species grew where none grew before. It's a circulatory system of ideas, information, and inspiration created by all and given to all. This concept has bubbled up throughout history as an aspirational goal, and yet we have new tools, powerful tools, to harness the governance of nature, to grow healthy soil, to grow healthy plants, to grow healthy people. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna choose to do with that new power? So I invite you to create a technology-enabled collaboration. I invite you to be inspired to democratize access to environmental and agricultural knowledge, because there's a role for all of us in understanding better how this world works. So I invite you to participate and support the projects that we're building at Wolf's Neck Center for Agriculture and the Environment. Building a regenerative farm network built on open source hardware and software and an open technology ecosystem for agricultural management. Because the future of agriculture that will support all of us will also need to look like all of us and be produced and created by all of us. Thank you. Please welcome Food Computer Program founder, Melanie Shimano. A few years ago, I watched this incredible TED Talk where the speaker talked about transforming our food systems with computer programming and robotics um, at a local urban agriculture level with an open source te technology they called the personal food computer. And if you're at Red Hat Summit in 2017, you might have seen Caleb Harper talk a little bit more in depth about what he and his team at the MIT Media Lab are doing with food computers and how they wanted to use this to change the food landscape, especially as the average age of the farmer continues to increase um, and to also help people get more interested in learning about plant characteristics and how we can grow food in creative spaces. Uh, a food computer so controlled that it kind of crawls out by itself. <laughs> um, how we can use it to grow food in creative spaces and how we can use this to address building a collective force around tackling this issue of solving a global population that's expected to increase to about 10 billion people who mostly live in urban areas in the next 30 or so years. And so living in Baltimore, I was pretty familiar with food systems challenges. One in four Baltimore City residents lives in a food desert or a healthy food priority area, which means people don't have regular access to grocery stores or outlets for healthy food. This obviously causes a problem for people's everyday lives, and it affects communities uh, disproportionately that are lower income in, in African American communities. And it also gives rise to larger health problems, such as uh, increasing rates of heart disease and diabetes. And in my experience in entrepreneurship and engineering, I knew that new technology could exponentially improve and help scale solutions to civic challenges, but really only if those solutions were founded upon true community needs and input. So I founded the Food Computer Program in Baltimore City Public Schools. It's a program that's aimed at encouraging students to use technology effectively in building and designing solutions for community challenges. And so in student science classes, we learn the basics of computer programming, uh, urban agriculture, engineering, human-centered design. We use those concepts and build food computers. And then we talk about how we can use this technology and similar technology to implement solutions to um, things that happen in their day-to-day -day lives. 
So what's a food computer? I've mentioned it a few times. Um, but as you can see, it's essentially a box that is uh, climate controlled with computer programming and robotics. So we try to uh, control the climate inside with, uh, for the hydroponic, plant, uh, hydroponic system where plants are growing inside. Um, so we're using wa uh, water and not soil, as you can see um, from the camera. That'll show it. So there are a few different iterations of the personal food computer from the open source community. But the version that we build is essentially this box with a basin that has the hydroponic system, the plants in there. Um, and then we have grow lights, a temperature sensor, and a fan that are all powered with a Raspberry Pi and Python code. So it sounds a little bit futuristic, but it's pretty simple. And especially due to the open source nature, um, it's actually much simpler than it sounds. So this is essentially what it looks like in, the, in a diagram. So we use Raspberry Pi as kind of the brain of the operation. And then we use other components. And we're essentially trying to mimic an outdoor environment inside this box to help plants grow. So what's the most important thing for a plant to grow is lights, obviously. And the cool thing about the, the food computer setup is that we're using all these components that are kind of like the, the basics of physical computing with a Raspberry Pi and using it and combining all these elements together. So we have code that's a simple like hello world of Raspberry Pi, which is how to turn on and off lights to mimic sunlight and daylight. So we can use this code to turn the light off if we want it to be nighttime. And then we use similar code to turn the lights on, again, to mimic daytime. So we can say, oh, we want to have a 14-hour day, a 20-hour day, a 5-hour day, and see how the plants react to that. And similarly, we have a temperature sensor inside. And different plants want different types of temperatures to grow in. And so we have that connected to a fan. So if we want the temperature to get a little bit warmer, we can turn the fan off. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to turn it down. But essentially, because of different environments, the lights kind of add some heat. The outdoor environment adds a little bit of heat. And so we might want to cool it back up again. So we run a similar code and just turn it back on. And basically, we're trying to regulate that, that temperature inside of it. So as you can see, uh, we use all these like, very simple components. And beside each of them, uh, apart from each other, are pretty simple. But when we combine them, we get this food computer that's essentially uh, this like, really cool open source project and uh, something that we can make some real things with. So we obviously are growing food inside of it. We can use it to cook with. And we're able to see how we can use technology to do real things. So students, despite never having written computer code before, build these and use the code and write the code with them all by themselves. And through our different builds and exploration of these food computers, we've been able to learn some coding and agriculture best practices from the folks at the MIT Media Lab and the open source community that spun out of it, um, as well as other educators around the world to improve our own food computer systems and better understand how we can use that to improve stuff that we're doing in Baltimore. So for example, we're trying to learn how to control algae growth within these hydroponic basins and how to grow root vegetables like carrots if we're using hydroponics instead of soil. So making the technology hands-on and easy to build on not only shows students what the technology can do in a real-world setting, but it also makes the technology more accessible and easier to build upon using their own expertise in urban agriculture and better understanding how they can, use, how they can improve their school, cities, and neighborhoods using more than just technology. So for example, after we built some of these food computers, students built their own versions uh, of the food computers and designed them uh, how they wanted to. They built out a room-sized food computer that holds kind of like 300 plants. They led uh, coding workshops for middle school students in the local community. They ran a breakfast sandwich business because we'd done so much cooking with the vegetables that we'd grown in the food computer class. And they were able to run a pop-up restaurant at a local food hall in the city using the plants that we grew in the food computers to make basils and chimichurri sauce for the sandwiches that they sold. So yeah, the open source tech allowed students to create some really cool food computers and learn about technology. But I think more importantly, it really expanded their worldview and showed the students how they could have an impact on it. And if we're trying to make our cities and neighborhoods smarter and easier to live in by incorporating new technology, why not teach our future leaders how the technology can be used to their advantage and then have them tell us how they want to incorporate it instead of transplanting talent around the globe to keep up with this changing technology. 
So if we use an open source technology model as a default for training and collaboration and new project uh, implementation, it can help create a more inclusive and expansive future where students are growing up to build the technology that complements solutions to these community challenges. In a future where, hopefully, I can see my students on the TED stage doing the same. And you can see these students, Tim, Zaire, and Ariel, doing that and how that's actually playing out right now in the class in the new open source stories film, which premieres tonight at 4.30. Thank you. Please welcome back to the stage, Tim Yaton. Hello, hello again. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, well, the folks we had just now, Lee, for doing such a great job uh, telling about the Open Studio. Our, th our three open source stories live, including Neil Dorn and Melanie. Uh, I have to say, I found Neil's story particularly stimulating intellectually. And I found Dorn and Melanie's story uh, particularly stimulating gastronomically. <laughs> now, I hope I'm not the only one uh, when Melanie was showing uh, her computer that was wondering if it can make cheeseburgers, no? Is that the only one? <laughs> well, I actually got to stop making those, those kind of jokes because my 16-year-old my talks about my dad bod. You know, dad, your dad bod. I prefer to think of it as a father figure. <laughs> That's the one and only dad joke you get the summit. Okay, so uh, on with our next segment, and this is going to blow you away, we promise. So at Red Hat, we're all about open source today and empowering and in inspiring our next generation of open source leaders. One way we've done this, particularly for those who were, were with us last year, is our program called CoLab, which is designed to introduce young students to a hands-on, open innovation experience. Now, this past year, we were preparing for an, a collab in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, and we found one school that had a truly unique way of pursuing open source, and they have a unique story to tell. And it all begins with a song. Woodre, would you please talk about the, your first time of being connected to Franklin Middle School? Um, my first time being connected with Frank, Franklin Middle School was when Mr. B called me and spoke to me about a school song. He said the school had just reopened, and he was like, you know, the kids need a sense of pride. They need something to sing about. Then next thing I knew, then Dre, that was my first time meeting you when you came into my office with the Future Boys and Future Girls, and you all did an a cappella version of the song based upon the lyrics that uh, you all had written together. And you really I liked cried. it. I know, you cried, I didn't want to say it. I cried like a baby. <laughs> you, you can say that, I cried, yeah. <laughs> but, but it did, it really just kind of transformed uh, the school community and people started feeling you know, proud to be a part of Franklin Middle School. It's kind of like the round table. Future Boys and Future Girls is the round table. We all equal. We sit there and we come up with ideas and you a leader here, you a leader here, you a leader here, so let's keep each other in line and figure it out. Strive for great in ESS. Let's go. 
We're taking off like rockets. We're taking off like rockets. We're taking off like rockets on our way. Three, two, one. Blast off. Now you do your part. What's your part after that? Ow, 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 Ladies and gentlemen, joining us from Minneapolis to perform a song they created just for Summit, please put your hands together for Mr. B, Mr. Dre, and the Franklin Middle School Future Girls! <laughs> Future, brighter, we, together, are, win, become, the, the, future, become, brighter, win, we, are, together. When you feel like all hope is gone, when it feels like you can move on, when your best don't seem good enough, just lean on me, we become stronger, we become stronger, we become stronger, we become stronger. We become stronger. When it seems like our hope is gone, when it feels like you can move on, when your best don't seem good enough. Just lean on me, we become stronger, we become stronger, we become stronger, we become stronger. Yeah, 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 look on your left, look on your right, you got friends on every side, clap your hands, say it loud, I can make it, say it now, stronger than I ever been, sometimes it only takes a friend, hold you up, help you out, I can make it, say it now. We become stronger, we become stronger, we become stronger. Now. No, 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 I just can't stop now. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hands up! Hands up! We did that, guys. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Good job, guys. Okay, who has dry eyes still? <laughs> really? So, being from Boston, all I've got to say is that was wicked awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, so one more round of applause. These girls work really hard. Good job, guys. I'll do it tomorrow. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about the story behind what you've just seen. And to do so, I'm gonna invite Mr. B, Dre, and the future girls into a conversation. Uh, shall we? Yeah. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we do. So girls, we've been talking about this for a couple days. Was it awesome or what? Did you love being on stage? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We all know the feeling. So it was awesome. We're so glad to have you. Now, um, just to start off. So, Taylor, you know, you were part of the Red Hat Collab experience. So tell me about what you created. What we created was, we created paper circuits. So basically we just took materials like copper tape, LEDs, and a battery, and we made what's called a code book. 
So code book. Yes. So can you tell me tell us a, a little bit more about it? Actually, we can show you. Let's do it. Come on. <laughs> All right. So Taylor, fill us in. It's mighty big. Uh, I see my friend Caitlin here will show you how the book works. So this right here is our code book. This is our code book, and we all created it. Some of us create, all of us created our own pages, and some of them light up, and some of them make noise. Uh, nice. Ah. And even though, we, even though we had a hard time, we all helped each other through. That's really awesome. And you all did it together. Yep. So. Yes. So at the end, um, you, know, you now have a book that everybody's contributed to, much like an open source project, as we've been talking about today. So did everything go as planned? I'm guessing maybe not. And so um, you know, when you had a little bit of a hiccup or a failure, how did that change your perspective? Um, to me, failure is just all mental. Um, actually, in this group, we never experienced failure. We had challenges, but we took the challenges and we learned how to problem solve so we could push forward with the challenge. That's awesome. So, Luna, what about you now? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks, Taylor. So, question for you, Luna. Mm -hmm. So, teachers typically don't teach how to fail, right? Yeah. So. Um, what did you learn through the process, being in CoLab, creating the code book, uh, that changed how you think about failure? Mm, the thing that I learned when doing all of this was that failure isn't a one-person thing. It's everybody's. It's everybody's problems at times. Saying that what Taylor was saying, that the reason we weren't failing was because we didn't give up. Saying that, to me, giving up means that we're letting this be something that we don't want to do letting it be our failure. That's awesome, good, good job, thank you. All right, so let me just jump down here and uh, I wanna talk to uh, Mr. B and Dre. Um, so there's so much of this story to tell. Um, we did a whole series, in fact, and you all can see this. Uh, it's called Like Rockets. At the end, I'll show you how you can go see it. But we really wanna talk about the performance. So. Um, how is it working with a big group like this to write a song? Well, working with Mr. B, a.k.a. Marky Mark, and us being the funky bunch, <laughs> we, come, we, yes, have, we have boss. a good time <laughs> and have, you know, we have a lot of fun. But the young ladies, they help us out from production to songwriting, the good ideas making in, the bad ones. Ah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Mr. B, you know, you've been with these girls for a long time. Um, what was it like to be a mentor and see them go through this experience? Well, the collab experience engaged them to learning in the highest level. And to have students come up to you afterwards, and Mr. B, I didn't know I could, you know, participate in such, you know, a technology project like this. And then for them to say, in the end, I did it, was very inspiring. That's awesome. I mean, it's an inspiring group, and I, and I know everybody out here is equally inspired. So. Big round of applause. So last question. So girls, now that you've done the dance, you've written a song, you've been out here on stage, was it a lot of fun? Yes! All right. Well, thanks again. Thanks to you all, and enjoy your time here in Boston. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I told you you'd be blown away. Um, oh, just awesome. And it's been an amazing afternoon. I hope you think so too. You know, we really, despite all the fun, we try to demonstrate the power of the open source model in its broadest context and just saw, sh shared a few examples of how it's applying in all factors of humanity. Now, uh, before we go, uh, please be sure to check out uh, the work you've seen on stage. So first of all, the Open Agriculture film will be premiering today at 4.30 p.m in room 210A. Uh, relative to the future girls, you can go to redhat.com slash like rockets to see their full story. Most importantly, the future girls are gonna be down at the open source stories booth on the show floor this afternoon and tomorrow. And I'll just say, if you think they're impressive on stage, wait till you talk to these girls. 
Um, I'll tell you one quick anecdote. Uh, we, we had our first uh, introduction, and I'm just trying to give them some fatherly advice around, you know, don't worry about how big the audience is. You know, it's, it's, um, you can't see them all anyway. And Taylor, who you met, said immediately to me, well, Tim, the bigger audience, the better. That's the more people that can hear our story. And that's what they're all like. So definitely go down, meet them in person. And please uh, join us back here tomorrow morning's keynote. We're going to hear from Boston Children's Hospital, and that's part of the general session keynote. So I hope you enjoyed the day two afternoon, and please enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you very much.